Let's go. Uh, Ryan Yuson. Listen, uh, first of all, thank you for um, you take this time with us. Um, I know you're completely busy. Uh, I know people are getting gathering around. Like uh, I just finished a workout right now with Kathy. Uh, one of uh, Tom's students, Matthew, he's been on, on that. I think Tom put Matthew to spot on me to make sure I'm working out, you know? <laughs> Tom, on the workout session, he disappeared. He come like a ghost. But anyway, Rodrigo. Uh, I was teaching you. my class, Buyo. I had my kids' class right before this. Don't come BS with me, bro. I want to choke you out. Uh, Rodrigo, I, uh, I know some people is going to start to come uh, on the chat. Uh, everybody's finished the classes and things like that. But one thing that um, is important to everybody probably like uh, know about you is in my opinion, uh, you are one of the pioneers of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in San Diego. Uh, and look into your pictures, look into your Instagram, most likely your Facebook right now, because I noticed you being very active on that. Uh, I saw the active big names and no active big names. Uh, they're, they're probably like when they arrive in San Diego, they started to go to your gym. So the way that I see, I see your gym as a reference for many well-known top competitors and not so well-known competitors, but good training partners. Alongside, I saw the pictures, of course, Minotauro. Uh, I saw Saulo Ribeiro in your gym. I saw André Galvão. I saw uh, Paul, even Margarida. Fernando Pontes, Margarida. Uh, my question is like for, especially for the people that might be don't know, well, they will know you because of me, of course, because um, I even play with them that since you and Toko are the first generation of black belts on the Carson, I'm the second one. And my students, they're going to be the third generation of black belts on the Carson Gracie lineage. It's a very exclusive, especially students that come from white to black. It's kind of like a unique select group, you know. But I want you like to, I would like to you explain, like for people that, you know, uh, now they're very successful. They have gyms, uh, associations and all of that. How do you feel the growth? of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu specific in San Diego, when those people, um, when those professors, competitors, they arrive and they didn't have pretty much no contacts, they pretty much didn't have nobody to talk and they just come to you as a reference. How your opinion about it? Like, cause uh, I, I, I see slightly at my gym and I even tell my students, like of time, we have a lot of visitors. I think uh, towards to summer and towards to winter, we have a lot of a lot of people that are black belts or blue belts or purple belts. They come to our gym, they train, you know, and they 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 feel the vibe and the energy, which is you taught me that few energy vibing to expand, you know, commodity, loyalty, friendship, you know, and that's important. How do you feel about it like now? after I think 25 years that you've been in San Diego alone, like how do you see that growth of multiple jiu-jitsu academies? How do you see the growth, especially in San Diego? But you can say overall, cause you are, you are a traveler. Uh, you, you have a lot of associations, a lot of affiliations. I'm glad that to be able to you, when you have your schedule, you come to the gym. My students are very grateful. Uh, they actually like your seminars. They love. How do you feel Rodrigo, nowadays after this, probably like a quarter of a century past, the growth of jiu-jitsu technique-wise, you know, athletes, uh, competitions, tournaments. How do you, how, how, what's your overall opinion about all of that? So uh, first, good evening, everybody. There's a lot of people just show up. Oh, you're going to have a lot of people, oh. trust me. Yeah, you know, uh, Hawaii, I was jealous of then I might I gotta say that it's a background I got <laughs> so I'm new in Zoom. So you know good evening everybody guys thanks for joining us 
and uh, we're gonna have a nice chat. So I'm gonna answer right now uh, Michelle question, and you know, guys, feel free to ask me uh, whatever you guys want. I know how how Tony and Michelle are gonna manage that, but let's go. So you know, Michelle, I'm I'm very fortunate, man. You know, to to see the growth of the sport. I don't think just in San Diego, no, but the whole uh, world outside Brazil. You know, uh, I start very young, you know, in Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, my first contact with Jiu-Jitsu was when I was 12 years old. But uh, I was already doing Judo since I was five. And uh, in Brazil, I was very small, you know. So I, I think I was the first wave of kids that starting some, somehow got a contact with Jiu-Jitsu and fall in love before it became popular. And I think by the end of the 80s, you know, it started to become more popular in Brazil. And the beginning of the 90s, like uh, when you open up Jera Sauna, you, I don't know if you guys know, Michelle was our first student there. Michelle was my first student. So, you know, he's my first guy to walk in the camp. So, you know, that, you know, that one come up really big in Brazil. States in 1996, you know, it was only the second Pan American Games. And in Los Angeles, was only, you know, was uh, the Gracie Torres, was a horse in, in, in Orion. Higgs and Gracie, that he was just left Great Torres, he opened his own business. Then the Machado brothers, they all teach together. Then Joe Moreira, you know, and we are the next one, we're the number five, the Christian Grace Academy in West Hollywood, you know, and the, you know, the, you, you live there, Michelle, but most people doesn't know that uh, I've been here in this country 25 years by accident, you know, I never planned to come to stay to live uh, in 1996, man, I was probably one of the top uh, athletes in Brazil, you know, I was at the top of my game in a, a brown belt, you know, I was winning top five brown belts in the country, you know, and eviction in the world because uh, back at the time I was only in Brazil. Uh, and I had an object of song with a bunch of amazing students. It was right next door to my house, man. My life was perfect. So I fought the 1996 World Championship. The Michelle was there. And I came to United States to spend one month with $800 in my pocket, you know, and and as I did, I went, I came to San Diego first, you know, to visit one of my friends that I grew up together for me, I was studying here, uh, Dujina. Then I, I stayed with him for one week. Then I cut a plan from San Diego to Oahu. Then I stayed in Oahu for another week. Then I went to Maui, stayed one week in Maui. Then I went to Kauai, stayed one week in Kauai and flew back to LA to spend my last five days in Los Angeles with Carson and Vito Belfort. There was our students in Nova Geração, and I brought him to Carson, and they just moved into the United States uh, with the products to make Victor to fight UFC. And the story is really cool, guys. A lot of people doesn't know this, but what happened was uh, when Hoyce fought the first UFC, you know, that shocked the world. You know, a lot of people involved in martial arts, fans, and, you know, uh, promoters, all the martial artists said, man, how come uh, a skinny guy from Brazil, you know, 170 pounds, 160 pounds, beating guys like 250, 240, you know, like, a, and everybody was shocked. So one of these guys was shocked, man, and he was one of the biggest uh, martial arts uh, enthusiasts. And one of the richest guy in LA, his name is John Peter. He's one of the owners of Warner Bros. You know, I can show you guys a picture right here. That's somehow here, somewhere right here. So I'm gonna keep speaking and I'm gonna try to find a picture for you guys. So this guy, when he find out about, uh, you know, when he saw UFC and he gets shocked about Royce, he said, man, where's this guy come from? So he starts studying the Grace family, you know, and he found out that Carson was there in 1995 in LA, was when the first Carson moved to LA, and he spent like just one day in a gym because he, one promoter, one uh, investor, opened a gym for him, and 
the day he came to teach his first class, that was 1995. He met there one of his, his rival. Now, one guy was to be rival jiu-jitsu, Marco Ruas. And he said to the guy, man, I'm not teaching Marco Ruas here. And the guy said, oh, man, sorry, I'm promoting. I opened the camera for both of you guys. He said, no way, I'm leaving. He left next day. But he was his first contact with John Peter, this guy from Warner Bros. And Carson was supposed to come back. So he came back in 96 with Vitor Belfort. And John opened a camera for Carson, you know, in West Hollywood. And... I fell by accident because, like I told you guys, I came as a vacation to spend one month, like 45 days, to have my, my realize that dream that I had since kid to go to Hawaii in California. And, you know, like five days before I get back home, everybody there waiting for me, Buyu, talk everybody. Carson came to me at nighttime and said, man, why don't stay here? You know, you're going to open the academy in like a few we don't have instructor because Vitor is gonna be training for the UFC. We wanna make sure that he, you know he have a you know a training routine, not be you not be worried about teaching. And man, you the best teacher here, you know. Like uh, so, for me it was a tough decision. I didn't want to stay. Like I said, guys, I brought eight hundred dollars, man. No, I was I had like probably another fifty dollars in my pocket because uh, the, you know I was traveling. I had a bag full of gifts for my for my friends and my family in Brazil. And I called my parents and I told my parents, you know, Carson offered me to stay there. And my father told to me, like, Rodrigo, listen, you know, more than money, more than anything, my friend, is this experience you're going to have to live with, the, with Carson. You know, uh, you know, Carson is a legend, you know. And just for the record, now, when I moved to Carson Academy, and Michelle, I think you did a wrong mention right there. You know, uh, of Carson generations, Carson generation black belts. Man, I'm generation black belts from Carson. When I moved to Carson Academy in 1986, you know, Carson was not teaching no more. You know, he was just the manager academy. You know, he had junior teaching, De La Riva, Marcelo. Day, as my partner came to me and said, man, this is a unique experience you're going to have you not know, to live with him. Because I said, wow, you know, so Carson put a point for me. By that point in my life, I was already a brown belt. I was competing for him since uh, probably for, since 1986, no, so for 10 years competing on him already. In every belt, he gave all the belts for me. But he was the presence, you no, know, the personal, the, 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 the myth, you know, the idol, the master, you know. So I never had a, never trained for him before. You know, I never, like, uh, he was a guy that was showing up. He was managing school. He was already, like, uh, almost six years old. So he was showing up, doing competition to just put a team together and put a team to compete. And let me tell you something. That was everything. Because when you're competing, and Carson was there in the corner, my friend, you give your life for that guy. You know what I mean? He was a, he was a guy that couldn't uh, compliment so much in a team spirit. Man, it was incredible was incredible, and that comes from him, and I think he, all his students bought the idea, you know, to, to fight for his name, fight for his flag. That's why we dominated this competition in Brazil uh, scenario for 30 years. For 30 years, because of this team, for one weekend, so uh, when I moved to LA, you know, so I, I, my father told me, you know, why not? Then I say, okay, I'm staying, I'm staying for one year. So my first uh, plan was to stay for one year and leave for Carson. And uh, in one month, I changed my mind because uh, basically back in 96, man, you know, in Brazil, uh, we didn't have too much, uh, uh, you see the World Championship, for example, was not live in TV. We didn't have magazines. Only starting, you know, like a more sponsor, more, more, more uh, companies, you know, uh, to want to be involved in the sports. So as few people with sponsors was, uh, was really hard to make it. You know, you had a lot, of, a lot of good fighters already and it was really hard to make it. And again, for the records, that's when Carson Grace's team with the Gi started losing competition. Why? Because of, again, it was just the UFC starting. So a bunch of the top jiu-jitsu guys from Carson, the best, the best ones, they start moving to Vale Tudo and MMA, 
you know, so they, they, they kind of immigrate for the MMA, Vale Tudo. So basically, I came from the, with that wave, you know. So uh, I stay in LA for, for, you know, for teach for uh, initially for one year. But in one month, I changed my mind because when I started teaching for police officers, for actors, for, you know, uh, uh, firemen and a bunch of important people from Hollywood. You know, we teach, I taught Sharon Stone, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Shaquille O'Neal, Katarina Zeta-Jones, uh, Mickey Rourke, uh, Kevin Costner. They all came to train with us. And I, I was amazed, amazing time because he's a kind of Ryan last standing of Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood on a blood, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a strongest point in Los Angeles. The owner of the Academy, owner of Warner Bros. So this guy was bringing every week someone important. He was really involved. And basically the history is he wanted to, to make that Academy for Carson. And in exchange of that, he wanted to make a documentary, had the rights to make a documentary about Carson's life. So that was my first uh, initial steps on, you know, jiu-jitsu history in the United States. And like Michelle said now, that was like when the first academy in, in, in Los Angeles, in California area. And basically, so this, there's a guy here, guys, watch it up, everybody. So this guy in the middle is John Peter. It's me and a right of the, the leather jacket, Victor between me and John, Carson right after John Peter, and the blonde girl on the left side, she's the, she did the alien, I forgot her name, she won an actress, a Hollywood actress, she was dating John Peter back that time. And, you know, here's me, Carson training, that was our boxing coach. So I had a great experience because I started having classes with Carson daily, like almost every day. You know, and doing position home, man, you know, like, and I had the experience to live with him. I share a room for him with two years and two months. I mean, his only student that had that pleasure. With all the hundred black belts he had, a thousand students he had, I'm the only one that share a room with him for two years and, and two years and two, and two months. I have so many material and pictures, videos that I one day I want to make a documentary release. You now I try to find the right person to do this. But, uh, you know, uh, so what happened was like, uh, so here's like, a, we start training MMA a lot. And so I'm knowing a lot of people. And, you know, I, I before Brazil, I, I was all about sports, jiu-jitsu and judo. And I started having experience, you know, in training boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai, you know. Uh, so here's a me and Murilo Bussamante right before he fought, uh, I mean, a top Murilo in the bottom. That was in, uh, when he fought uh, Tom Eriks in extreme fighting championship and you know from there on i started knowing a lot of people and meet a lot of people and you know see jiu-jitsu another way you know and see how the american people start about jiu-jitsu so my first one year passed by i came back to brazil you know and i went to tell my parents they're gonna come back you know i'm gonna sit there for longer and my parents initially said thought there's gonna be one year so that was a big shock for my family and for for all the back in of generation because uh, you know, what I told my parents, I'm going to say one year, I told all my students from Nova and Toko, my partner, you know, but as they come back, say, guys, there's so many things going on right there, right now, that I cannot, I cannot come back to Brazil no more, you know, from now on. So, I come back to Brazil, I pick up more stuff, say, I'm come back to the United States again, you know, and take over, complete all the program for Crash Grace Academy in, 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 uh, in West Hollywood. Was incredible because, uh, one of the, uh, you know, when, when I come back at first time, 97, man, I was still using a, 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 a tourist visa. My visa was uh, moving to, for tourists to, to work visa. And I remember when I went to the immigration, and immigration, I say it's always been scary for Brazilians, you know? And uh, the lady was, saw my passport, she said, oh, Castro Grace Academy, because the, the, my visa is already uh, with the stamp, and, and they, have, they have like a, a stamp with the, the name of the business you now was sponsoring me. Castro Grace Academy in Los Angeles, I said, oh, you know the Grace family? I said, yeah, yeah, that's where, where I teach, I'm working. Oh my God, you know, that's amazing. So basically this lady, she, can, she, came, she came as my student, and she brought her three kids to train for us. Immigration from the, from the, for the a lady for the immigration department. 
you know. And back day, back that time was not even Homeland Security, no, Department of Security, it was like a, it was immigration, INS, Immigration Authorization Service. So anyways, in Brazil, as Michelle can remind you guys too, we had a lot of bad reputation, you know, uh, from the 90s, you know, then the 90s was just become popular. A lot of people was fighting in the streets, so we were considered pit boys. So that kind of uh, pushed a little bit on the side, you know, all the big media and you know, sponsors to be and join Jiu Jitsu. So, you know, the guys that was doing Jiu Jitsu back, back that time, it was because we really loved the sport and believed the sport. So in the United States, I come to here, man, and I see the value of the American people to the sport, man, that makes me wow. So that can be uh, survived for three years and a half, basically for some reasons, you no, know, the documentary about Crusher Life didn't happen. John Peter won't stop uh, sponsor the Academy, and we didn't have the the experience, the tools, you know, the the contacts, you know, to to make the Academy happen. You know, it was in a very high point in the city, you know, it was a very very expensive. But but Vitor was already a UFC champion, you know, he already fought two F, two FCs or three. And, you know, we, everybody know who you are already. You just was like growing, you know, I, I helped organize the first Pan American Games and the national championship. So uh, I was always going to San Diego. You know, almost like every other weekend, I would spend a week in San Diego with this friend of mine, Dujinha, because I always liked more San Diego vibe. You know, to surf, you know, to meet a lot of Brazilians living in San Diego. So after three years and a half, the Cross of Grace Academy closed in Los Angeles, I just crossed move back to Brazil, you know, to keep the training. And that's basically when it break down, you know, Castle Grace break down, it was great BTT. And I say, man, what are I going to do it? So I initially, uh, one of my students invited me to teach in East LA, to open a cabin in East LA, in Whittier, Whittier, California. So we opened a cabin in Whittier. And from Whittier, yeah, I said, morning, this from Whittier. I said, there you go, girl. That was my first academy, right? Uptown Whittier. And now I have some good memories there. So I was in Weeder and I said like, there was nothing to do there. I was trained the whole week. It was amazing for me because I was training boxing, wrestling all day. There was no distraction. And so I competed a lot. I went to fight in Abu Dhabi, the first Abu Dhabi ever in 1998. Then uh, uh, 99, next year, we moved to La Habra. It was next door to Weeder. You know, they can move place you know, for a different building. But I started going more to San Diego, you know. At one point in my life, I was uh, uh, working out in San Diego in a gym. And this gym was owner. The owner was uh, one of the Ironman champions. His name is Mark Allen. And he came to me and he knew about Jiu-Jitsu too. He found out about Jiu-Jitsu and offered me, hey, you want to teach us here? You know, a small group of guys. You know, I can pay well, I say, wow, and I say, okay. Basically, I was, you know, I was, I was renting a house with my partner in the academy there, and I was going to San Diego almost every other weekend, you know, and stay in my friend's house, Dujinha's house. So when I decide, when Mark Allen offered me to teach in San Diego also, I started going to San Diego every weekend, like Thursday night, and Teach Thursday night in the academy, Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Drive back to Weeder, I'm sorry, to La Habra. Back to La Habra. And I did that for two years. Every week, every day, every time. Later, then I was sleeping on a couch on my friend Eugenia, like almost for a year, you know, when I was going to San Diego because I didn't have money to, to have two places. One year later, I kind of uh, changed it. I rent an apartment in San Diego and started going to La Habra and sleeping in a match. So I was sleeping in a match from Saturday, Monday night class all the way to Thursday. Then I started cutting one more day. You know, I started, started to stay more in, in San Diego than in LA because I prefer, you know, I, I prefer the lifestyle, the quality of life. And man, that's what I did basically. At one point, I saw the camera to Kiko and Rodrigo Antunes, two of my students. And they take over the academy in La Habra, and I stay in, in San Diego. And I get my academy. You know, I changed for this gym that was teaching, and I get my academy cash streets in Pacific Beach that uh, I still have today. You know, the academy cash streets has been there for 20 years. 
when I went to San Diego, I was only two academies, Fabio Santos and Nelson Monteiro. And Nelson Monteiro was just moving to Abu Dhabi, you know, with the Prince Tahanun and, you know, and was leaving his academy from San Diego to one of his students. So basically for black belts, I was the second one in San Diego, you know, when I, when I opened my academy in 2000 there in Cash Street. But Michel, uh, then eventually, I started going traveling all, all the way to Europe. So for, I still going, you know, for since 2000, I started to go into Europe in the same scene that I saw in the United States when I went to the United States in 96. Uh, I saw in Europe, man. I was seeing, started going to some countries like Greece, Turkey, Spain, Switzerland, Ireland, Scotland, England, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary. And man, all guys are blue belts, purple belts, learning by VHS, learning by DVD, you know, like, you know, learning by, so it was very roots, right? The sport's still growing in these countries. And I saw the whole process, you know, from zero points, you know, to what is today, you know, like it's everywhere. It was an amazing experience, man, to, to see that happen, you know? And I believe that still going to grow a lot more. You know, we're going to grow a lot more. And uh, so, uh, oh, the other, the other question, Michelle. So, uh, my time in San Diego, when I moved to Pacific Beach in Cash Street, by 2001, we get a lot of talent kids there. You know, kids from Brazil are training for us, some American kids, you know, a lot of local surfers. And we start competing because I come from the blood of a competition blood. And... I said, man, I want to, I want to make it like a good uh, uh, team. And I was all about competition. I was still competing a lot, you know, and uh, every tournament. So my students are following me, competing with me. And that kind of became like a, a, a kind of model academy, you know, of competitions in, 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 in California. So every big tournament in California, by an American Games, World Championship, you know, like uh, Nationals, Everybody was coming to my academy in San Diego, you know, a week before, two weeks before the competition, and training for the competition for the last two weeks, compete, then go back to their house. You know, so we had amazing guys here. So I mentioned, like, you know, uh, André Galvão, Mario Reis, Xande Ribeiro, uh, Saulo Ribeiro, André Galvão, uh, so many guys, Tarsis, Humphrey, you know, coming to train for us all the time. So every time, and we every day have some black belt visitors, you know, come to train for us. And my guy didn't stay there for us for one year. You know, he came and never left. So it was amazing. You know, we, we won the national championship seven times, seven years. You know, U.S. national championship. We won the Pan American championship in 2001. You know, uh, uh, and again, from one little roof, you no. Know, then a few of my students are open. Small, two small place. You now the teams are growing. The found BJJ Revolution team, you know, and make like a national aisle. And and these guys said that I was going to Europe to visit every year. Every year I spent like a, probably forty five days, two months in Europe. You no, know, going with a backpack, you know, both geese and my belt, and going to different countries to teach. You know, and I saw this guy growing up. You know, growing up, and some guys become my students. Some of them become my affiliates, some not, you know, become my friends or affiliate somebody else. And it was, it's amazing, you know, like uh, today in Ireland, we have nine academies, you know, if you count all the academies together. We have academies in, du five academies in Dublin, one in Limerick, one in, in Galway, one in uh, Belfast, and one in Cork. So, you know, it's amazing, you know, so, uh, it's really good to be, be part of the the progress, see the, all the progress growing, you know, how to see how jiu-jitsu is getting big, it's getting better, it's getting stronger, you know, and, uh, and I, 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 am a, I am a soldier, you know, of the sport. That's the way I see myself, you know, and if I can, uh, we, we sell uh, health lifestyle. You know, on, 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 the, on this time of life right now, you know, what's going on in the world right now is when you have to use your jiu more than ever. And that's exactly the way I learned it. That's exactly the way I see it. And they're, they're, I think that we all just practice, you know, had to be as an example to everybody, you know, to be calm, you know, don't panic, you know, it's like, just like a fight, you know, someone mouths you, you don't panic, you know, 
and try to get out of the bad situation and come back, you know, strong without get panic, without, man, uh, uh, lose control, you know, and that's the way I see Jiu Jitsu, you know, and again, we don't sell Jiu Jitsu, you know, we don't sell arm bar, we don't sell a foot lock, no, we sell health style, lifestyle, a healthful way to see life, you know, the correct way to see life, you know what I mean? Uh, acting with discipline. Because you're all human beings and we have mistakes, we all have, you know, you know, and when you eat, you know, when you, someone in a traffic cut you off and you don't, you know, overreact, you know, how you treat a, a woman, how you treat a, a, your wife, your kids, you know, and that's how you have to use this all the time. And times like this right now, you live right now, is a, a really, really important time for us to use our you know. Uh, we're gonna have to adapt, just like jujitsu. You know, like you get older, you have to adapt. You know what I mean? I'm uh, talking too much. No, you talk good, Rodrigo. I just gonna say that uh, just because of, uh, I, I mean, I know Juan is on the chat. His brother Raul is in Scotland. Actually, he's training, and just so have an idea, like with this whole situation, uh, one of his friends uh, just like commit suicide because he couldn't handle you know, inside of the campus. So imagine this, we are in a lockdown. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I never been to Scotland, but according with the Juan was really, really strict. So this kid could handle the situation, you know? Uh, but I, just to give it a thought, how jujitsu is important to many of us, like to stay healthy, to stay safe and conscious mind. So we have a lot of questions here, uh, Professor Rodrigo. Oh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, Amir guide the questions. And I just want to sure. say that Rodrigo did tap for me one time, guys. Uh, the way that happened was this. I was sitting on the, on the beach watching the ocean and Rodrigo tapped on my shoulder. Hey, you want to train jiu-jitsu? So that's the first tap that he had on me. So he has a school open down the street. So I can say that Rodrigo did tap for me. But in another way, we didn't, I didn't train your jiu at that time. Go ahead, Professor Amir. Professor Rodrigo, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Amir. Uh, Professor, we have a lot of great questions for you tonight from the audience. Um, a lot of people are wondering what your favorite submission is. Uh, today, I like the cross choke, man. Just for the mount. That's my favorite one. Awesome. I like awesome. to go the high mount, you know, and I, from there, I, I get a cross choke. If the guy defends the choke, I get the arm, you know, but most of the time I get a choke, you know. But before, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of triangles, you know, but I don't know now, I don't know why my knees hurt, you know, but I still get some times, but not as, as, as you know, I, I become more like a top game when I get older. That's perfect. You led right into the next question. People are wondering what your favorite what, uh, submission was when you started and how it's changed over the years. So you already answered that for him. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, brother. Now people are asking what your favorite guard pass is. Your favorite guard pass. Man, and I, have one, I have one guard pass that I do, guys. That's the, some guys call the Mira guy, right? It's one who had one on the hook, the other one over, you know what I mean? I love to put myself in that position. It is a little bit risky, you know, because you have to really eliminate the bottom leg because, if, you know, you have one arm under the leg, right? And the other one, you have your arm over the leg. So it's basically your, your body's like this, right? One under, one over. And I can pass left and right. So pass is my favorite guard pass, you know, like, uh, and, but the point is this is the one, you know, the, is the harder part is to put yourself in a position, to put yourself in a situation. You know, so that's the game. So basically right now for myself and for years I've been doing this pass is that to find more ways to put myself in the situation, you know? Awesome. And uh, just to answer, I don't know if you guys anyone going to answer that, but I, when I'm competing, there's only, uh, when I, the fight starts to stand up, right? So basically uh, there's only, one situation that I don't want to put myself inside someone's closed door. So when I fight with someone, I try to play top, I try to work the takedown, and then when I, most of the takedowns that I do, I don't end in someone's closed door. So I usually end in the half guard or butterfly, or sometimes I write in the side. 
If it doesn't happen, the guy is better than me, stand up, and I think that I cannot put him down, I put him in my close guard. I like the close guard a lot. The close guard is a unique guard, man, because you fight to unlock the legs. So after unlock the legs, you still have to find another guard. The spider, or whatever, open guard, you know, the La Riva, whatever position, if you pass stand up on the floor. So basically, you know, the close guard is different for any other guard. If you guys understand about the close guard position, think about that. If you revert, you go to the top, you win a mount. It's basically the same position. So most, most of the things you can do from the mount, you can do in the close guard, and even more from the close guard. You know what I mean? So it's way easier to get triangle for the close guard and get from the mount, right? Alma plata. So I, I same way, you know, when a mount or a close guard for me is the same. That's why I feel very comfortable in the close guard and for chips by the close guard. Perfect. Thank you, Professor. Professor Buyo is telling me you still compete, sir. Is that true? Yes, yes, I'm still competing. I I stopped for I stopped competing from 2000, uh, 2007 from 2012. I didn't compete in the tournament for five years. I didn't compete. I got bored. My body started getting really tired about it. My daughter born in between the eight, the, the time. Then I was I went to Hong Kong. I, I lived in Hong Kong for two years and a half. You know, you open giant academy there. So when I went to Hong Kong to live there in 2012, uh, uh, and that's another, another good story to do. You know, I, is that what I saw in the United States? I saw in Europe. I saw also in Asia, you know, like then when I moved to Hong Kong, there was only one academy. And today in Hong Kong, it's about 10 academies. There's academies in Taiwan, Macau, Malaysia, Singapore. You know, I've been going to China a lot, you know, to teach there, man. Shanghai, Beijing, man. First time I was there, was not even one blue belt in the whole country. Today, you go to Shanghai, there's a bunch of Brazilians teaching there, man, amazing black belts there. So I saw that they all the progress there. You know, I, I moved there, it was 2012, almost 10 years ago. So, uh, so when I moved to Hong Kong, we started training. Uh, I started training my students for the Asian Opens in Tokyo, and I was five years old competing. And I, I started training well and said, "Man, competing too." Then I, I won the, the my division and the Open division, Master One, and I never stopped competing again. Then I competed in 2013 again in Asia Open. I won. Then 2014, I moved back to the United States. I started competing again. And I, I, since that, I didn't stop. Last year, I got second in the World Masters. You no, know, I lost the final by advantage. And, but I couldn't do the Pan Ams because uh, I got hurt right before the Pan Ams. I couldn't compete. You know? So my challenge right now, Amir, is to uh, train it as smart as possible so I can be able to compete, man. Because, uh, you know, in my age, I've been doing this for so long, man. You get injured sometimes sleeping. <laughs> We, you go to sleep, health, you wake up, man, if you're, you cannot move your shoulder. So you have to train smart, man. If you train, you know, really hard, it's really hard. You, 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 you probably don't make it, you know? So if I compete, I want to be ready and, you know, I want to be prepared to win. And that's my mentality. And I don't go there to have fun. I go there to win. You know, if I lost, man, you know, the guy was a better man, better man than me that day, you know? But uh, I think in my life, I've been competing since 1986. I lost only twice, you know. I got that only twice in competition for over like a thousand mats I had it, you know, and that's when I felt lost. Now, and in same, same, same way, uh, the, probably the thousand mats I had and I uh, probably submit about you know, one third of that. And that's when I think I won. I don't like to win or lose by points. So I know it's part of the game. You know, but uh, I swear for you, when I win by, if I don't tap the guy, I don't think I really won. If the guy don't tap, I don't think I really lost. No, so that's it. You know what I mean? Well, that's so inspirational, Professor. Thank you. Matthew's asking what your mindset is for competition. If you could elaborate a little bit about your mindset going into a competition. Matthew, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, Matthew, great question, brother. So, <clears throat> guys, like I say, first you meant, uh, uh, what I, what I when I started Jiu-Jitsu, now I think about competing. You know, I did some judo competition as a kid, you know, because uh, all the kids were doing, but I never enjoyed so much. You know, I was enjoying a lot of more doing like a soccer competition, surfing competition. Fighting for me was kind of a little, 
You know, I, I was doing just for myself to know how to defend myself. When I moved to Karsha Academy, the mentality changed. You know, I become all about competition because Karsha will give you attention for you if you're not competing. And it was wrong. You know, you cannot, judges should be to everyone. Competing or not should be to everyone. But, in my, but it is in my blood. Okay, uh, that's why I still compete. I'm 50 years old, I still competing. So you guys are going to see me for a long time there, win or lose. But uh, Carson always, always taught me something that I never forget. And that is not just for jiu-jitsu competition, but for any kind of competition you're going to do in your life, okay? Or for anything you're going to do in your life. If you want to do competition, you have to deserve to be there. So you have to train like a lion and fight like a lion. You know? If a little kitty comes to fight you, it's not your you know what I mean? You have to be more than ready. And when you, when you make that happen, you know, there's a lot of things involved. You have to train smart. And when you get older, you have to change the way you train, of course. You have to eat health. You have to take the right supplements. You have to sleep good. Otherwise, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. You know what I mean? Uh, you have to deserve to win. You know, you have to deserve to be there and you know, on the top in the same final, final, you, have, you know, you have to deserve to get a medal, guys, because otherwise, you know, so if you're going to waste your body, waste your time, if you're going to waste your energy, man, to a competition, the adrenaline is tough, you know, still, I still feel adrenaline, and I still have butterflies in my stomach when I go compete. You know, you had, you had to earn that. You had to make it happen. You know what I mean? You, okay, if I'm going to prepare myself at 50 years old, leave my wife and my kids in home, to go there that came for training for two hours, you know, uh, then later go do yoga, then later go do weights, man. You know, it had to be worth, you know what I mean? I had to go there to, you know, with a, with a goal in my mind. So that's the first thing. You had to be ready. You had to put, put yourself, you know, ready to competition. Then the strategy. So Matthew, you have to have a strategy in your head. What's the strategy is? Is whatever you do better. You know, when you train that academy, you say, man, that's my position on here, man. It can be anyone. I know what to do. That's, no, that's my home, my friend. I feel comfortable right here. So that's basically what it is. The strategy is the... And and Carson was the best guy. Carson was like so good. He he was the best point of game. And that's going to be a game going to be involved on that point. You know what I mean? Uh, I think in competition, like I just said earlier today, if you play by top game, it's easier to win. You know, if you see like a, most of the competition, you have a, one competition, if you see all the fights, I believe that probably uh, 7% of the fights going to win who stay on the top, you know. But again, if I'm going to find a guy really good in a, in a top, and I know maybe he can get two points on me and take me down and I start like two points down, man. You have to have some good game. No, you have to have another strategy. So I like to play top, accept someone's close guard, or I like to put some money in my close guard. So that's based on my, my mindset on a competition. You know, I don't put myself in these two positions. You know, and when I'm there, man, you know, like I, like I say, it's just one more day in the office. No, it's nothing new for you, you know. There's no... It's just be calm, and if you're feeling good, if you feel good energy, you know, and uh, and had the right strategy, it's all about that, you know what I mean? And that's uh, a lot too, like two things very important that I make me lost a competition one time, and is how how to manage to lose weight if you need it. That's very important, no? Because uh, that counts a lot, you know. Competition jujitsu, the official ones, you you you, you weigh in the same day, right before first fight, yes. <clears throat> and the way the way you sleep before, a night before. You know, if you are night before, my friend, like I lost a competition one time. I went to Pan American Games in uh, in uh, in Santa Barbara. That was like two thousand uh, three or four, a year before I won. Then I went to one of my students. And we share a room together. My friend, the guy snored the whole night. I couldn't sleep the whole night. Why can't you hear it? I couldn't sleep the whole night. And I went, I went to sleep with a headphone. I was like, man, I was, it was a nightmare, man. I was so bad mood. And I ended up losing the final, you know, because I was tired, man. I didn't want to go be there. Because if I, I'm the kind of guy that had to sleep well for eight hours. 
then the life is beautiful for me. But if I sleep bad, my friend, I have bad mood all day. You know, I, I, my, my body doesn't work. So today I'm going to go to the World Championship in Las Vegas. I got a room by myself. <laughs> you know, nobody bore me. Nobody know where I am, man. You know, and, you know, I get a room like 7 p.m. Close the door, you know, listen to my music. And that's it. Yes. I warm up on the room. You know, before the fights, you know, like uh, when I go to the, the, the gymnasium, I already sweating out, you know. That's very cool to say about this. I don't know if you guys feel the same. But uh, that I learned that years later, okay? I used to always, like, save my energy. And I noticed that I was my, my first fight was terrible. You know, I always had a hard time the first fight. Hmm. And sometimes I was losing in the first round. I was like, man, how that happen? I'm very way better than the guy. So when I went to fight in 1998 Abu Dhabi, you know, I was uh, on the one me up area to, to my first fight, and I saw the guy Mark Kerr. Mark Kerr, he was doing sprints. And all these guys stretching, you know, doing like this, you know, save energy. And the guys, American guys from wrestling, and I, I noticed Mark Kerr, he was doing sprints, man. I say, and, I, and in my head, I say, man, what a stupid guy gonna get tired before the fight starts. So anyways, two days before the competition, we had a boat trip with the priest you know, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi Bay. And Mark Kerr was there. I went to talk to him. Hey, what's up, man? My name is Rodrigo. Blah, blah, blah. And I introduced myself to him. was like Tata Ross, a bunch of guys there. And I asked him, man, why he did that? Why did the sprints? He said uh, to, to, to open the, the first, uh, you know, the first gas out. You know what I mean? To break down the first gas. And it's funny because when you're young, you don't feel that too much. But when you get older, man, that makes so much difference. So today, not just in jiu-jitsu. If when I go surf, I can surf for two hours. My, my first 15 minutes, I'm in slow I'm, uh, swimming. I can swim for one hour. My first 10 minutes, man, same thing. I'm slow. You know, my, 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 my breath is kind of heavy. Then after, open out. I don't know about rolling. guys feel the same thing. Your first round roll, man, your first five, five, ten minutes, after you don't break down sweats, you know, before you break, before you break down sweat, your reflex, you know, your timing is not there. Mm. So that's what I do today, man. And that's a great strategy, Matthew. What I do, like I sleep by myself in the room, I wake up in the morning, I turn on the heat in the room, and I do a yoga for 20 minutes. You no, know, I do a kind of, kind of a sun salvation. A lot of brain exercise, and I stretch, man, and I sweat. I start sweating like a, you know, a lot. And then I put a jacket and go to gymnasium. I'm ready to the first fight. Because when I get right there, if you're not already warm and I don't ready, like, you know, I didn't break the first sweat, it's not gonna happen there. Why? First, you go. What time I'm gonna fight? It's really hard, no? You already know. You already uh, prepare to the first fight. If you if you wait to come up right there, most of the time it doesn't work, you know. And and luck too, right? You had to be luck, man. I had to get luck to win, you know. It's not. I, I you had to come in luck too for for sure, you know. Absolutely. I've shared a, a room with Professor Tom a couple of nights before competition, MMA, Taekwondo, never again. I learned my lesson. But speaking of strategy, it, Professor... It is Abu Dhabi. Right. That's, uh, that's Abu Dhabi. So I fought Abu Dhabi. First Abu Dhabi, 1998. That's, that's uh, William Grace right there. Me, Kiri Peligro, Nelson Monteiro. There was a guy that, that made the first tournament and Carlos Valente. Wow, a lot of legends in that photo. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. We do have a couple other questions for you, Professor, real quick, if you don't mind. From Go ahead. Professor... I have the whole, the whole evening for you guys. Don't worry. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Michelle, I remember this one here. You guys know who that one Vito Belfort. Yeah. It's He's funny because no I used to play tennis with Vitor on, on the weekends, and he always up to something, you know? Like, uh, he's not just like jiu-jitsu. He always, like, up to something. Good memories, good man. Rodrigo have great pictures out there. Rodrigo, um, uh, 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 Professor Ami, do you have any questions there on the line? So I just he has more. He has more questions. We do have a couple, but you could go ahead. Okay. No, 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 no. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I have mine. Here. Maybe mm -hmm. I might infiltrate on yours. 
Okay, no problem. Uh, we have two questions that are very related. Who was your toughest opponent in your competition history? Your toughest opponent? And who would you love to be able to compete against today? Uh, man, I think Leo Vieira was really tough. We fought three times. I lost two. The only guy I lost more than one. And the three fight was the battle. You know, it's a very difficult guy to win because, uh, like I say, you know, the fight is like, be a, a, a fight, like a one times a person. One time is a brown, one time is a black. So he started getting better, uh, you know, in the middle of the fight. And, you know, he started like get more more energy, you know. And I said I was dropping my, you know, my, my energy. His energy was going up, you know. So he's a really tough guy. Love Vero is tough. He don't stop. You know? He's pushing all the time. And uh, when I fought Hanzo Grace in Abu Dhabi, in the semifinal of the, semifinal of the first Abu Dhabi 1998, it was really tough, too. We fought for 20 minutes. You know, was uh, was ten minutes, five, five. You know, so it was like it was pretty tough. You no, know, there's no points, no, no, nobody score points, but a lot of crash. You know, he has a lot of experience, so it was a really good uh, uh, experience, you know, to you know, to fight hands for twenty minutes. You no, know? a guy that I always like to. I always saw him fighting, and I had a chance to compete against him. It was a, a great, great uh, experience that I had. You now, and uh, even if I lost, it was pretty cool. You know, it was. It was good to, to test myself right there. Yeah. And today, I don't know, man. I, I don't fight anyone. I know a guy who really want to fight is Megaton. You know, Megaton is about my, my division right now. I, I, I like him a lot. He's, he's, his game, he's amazing. He's really good in, uh, in everything he do. And I think, and he's in my division, actually. You know, I just, I just went to the Master 5, and he's in the Master 5. I know how long. He's about four or five years older than me, but, I, you know, I hope I can catch him some, somehow. You know, in a competition, awesome. and the other guy is, is Barbosa. You know, it's another guy too. That's my division. It's one of the top guys in my division. Uh, Professor Marcos Barbosa, Brazilian guy, black belt, Jude, amazing. And I heard his pressure on the top is amazing. I like to feel that. Rodrigo, uh, both of them are, are master five, but featherweight. They fought. They fought last. Uh, right no, on. Barbosa in the middle. He 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 signed up in the finals in the middle this year when he got canceled. So I was when I, I signed up as a as a as a lightweight. Like just two days before the competition uh, 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 registration ends. Wait. And then they cancel the competition a week later. You know, I was going to fight Megatron in the Panans this year, but it didn't happen. I, I, oh, I here's a few, few of the troops in, in, in Leblon. Look at this. Ah, that's not that. Leblon. It's all Brazilian championship trophies. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you gotta send me those pictures. I know a lot of people are gonna ask you for that later. Five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Times are tough, right? <laughs> Professor, we have one more question before I let Professor Buyu jump in, if you don't mind, please. Go ahead, brother. I have the time for you, don't worry. Uh, when I was competing and a, a couple of other students asked, uh, how do you deal with anxiety, performance anxiety before a competition? Do you ever deal with that? Do you feel that? Yeah, but like I told you, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't feel, to, I feel anxiety until the fight starts, man. You know, it's, it's not, the anxiety is like waiting and, you know, the, the whole the process, you know, usually, usually when I go to, for, for example, I'm in San Diego and I uh, had to fight, go to Las Vegas to fight there and wait for the day to fight. You know, that, that, that's the worst part for me. Mm -hmm. You know, night before to sleep well, you know, so, but Amir, again, if you read, brother, if you train well, my friend, you had to know you did your best to be there, that's it. You know, I think the problem is when you do, you, in your head, you say, man, I could train more, I could do that more, blah, 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 you know? You know what I mean? So with your, your own limitations, you know, if you know that uh, you did your best, that's it, you know what I mean? So I usually, what I do is this, man, like, you know, for, since I started Jiu-Jitsu, you know, I never stopped. I just stopped when I, I had a, some injury. And I had men, you know, I don't have ACL on both knees, left and right. No ACL. I never did ACL surgery, but uh, I did meniscal surgery. But I never did ACL. So uh, when I was younger, I was training every day. Three, four hours a day. Sometimes twice a day. And you have to, you know, you get older, you start training less and less, man. You have to train smart. And not just this. You have to prepare a body for your training. 
You know what I mean? So what I used to do in my routine right now, I train twice a week, you know, like a strong, you know, I go there in the match and I train for one hour, you know, I, you know, I go with everybody. And the other two or three days, I just do drills or just do position or do specific training. I like a lot specific training. I like, you know, it's a good way to, to put yourself in a position that you feel too comfortable and to make the position more precise. But on top of that, I do yoga once a week, sometimes two, and I swim a lot. You know, I swim almost every day. If it's no surfing, if you surf, I go surf. But if no waves, I go to swim. Hmm. And about two years ago, I started doing weights. You no, know, I, I always hate to do weights, but I know how important it is. So I have my routine. So when I do it, I get close to competition. It's like a, what I do is this, like a, the competition, like a, I start training like two months before. And I, you know, I slow increase, you know, the, this, this hard training instead of twice a, a week, I start doing three or four times a week, like stronger training. Hi, yeah, got you here. Hi. <laughs> Why you don't know? Then what I do is like, uh, when I get close to the competition, I slow down again on the hard training. Like a week before, I slow down, I just rest and save my body and try to put my body, you know, all the pants that the training happens, no matter. So I go do a lot of compunctory, you no know, cupping, and, but I still swimming, you know, I still doing yoga just to keep stretching, you know. So I have, I have a routine that I do, man, you know, and that's it. You know, uh, the only thing can take me out of competition and the only thing I'm afraid actually is to get an injury. Hmm. If you get an injury like you're, you know, like two weeks, three weeks before competition, you're probably not gonna compete, man. Or you're not gonna be hundred percent. And this can happen. You know, in 2000, uh, 2007, 2018, I lost the semifinal of the, I won the 2017 World Championship, the Masters in Vegas. The 18 went there to, to defend my title. And the semifinal, I'm sorry, in the, in, the, in the quarterfinals, my knee shift out. You know, I was in a guy deep half guard, and my knee kind of like this, like, shh, and I won the fight. And I, I went to fight the semifinal, and I was, you know, limping my leg, man, I was slow and heavy. It was, it was not the same, man, and I lost. The guy, he ended up taking me down to two points, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't perform well. So that's the biggest point, you know what I mean? It's really hard. And when I say about lucky, the lucky counts a lot, you know, because, uh, you know, what happened that day? Look at this, guys. Look how crazy it is. So about lucky, right? Uh, I had about like a 20, 23, 24 guys in my division. Okay, it was master four lightweights. So I was one side of brackets, and the other, other guys here is the other side of bracket. So I was a buyer of the first two fights here. So two guys were gonna fight. I was winning to the, who see who gonna win to fight me. So I was already going to the second round. Oh, good enough. I said, oh, cool. So look what happened. The two guys, one guy didn't show up. And I was third one here, right? So the whole bracket under me, the, all, the whole other side went through. So the shoe guys on the side here semi final already. By the, the rules of IBJJF, they had to wait 40 minutes. So you call your name, if you don't show up, they had to call your name for 40 minutes until you show up, so disqualify you. And I'm the, the first guy here, and right, I'm right there waiting for this guy here to show up. So all the breaks went through. The other guy here under me fought twice, the other side of the guys fought three times. Then they come, they, you know, everything went through. Then they come back, they disqualified the guy, and I went to do my first fight, another guy first fight through. Man, we already cold, you know, like uh, I was already warm, warming up like five or six times already. Warm me up, get cold, warm me up, get cold, warm me up, get cold. So, man. so I, I, I won the first guy, but my body wasn't, you know, was, was already out of balance. When I went to quite the final fights, the guy was already resting, he had, he had two fights already, so the first guest went out already, and for him, on that point, rest was good. You know, he had two fights, two tough fights, he rest, got a little bit to raise. So I fought my, 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 my first fight. I, I sit down for four minutes, they come for the, for the next fight, because so 
all, the whole bracket to catch it up, right? And that's when my knee came out. You know, I was in deep half I won a guy. I beat him in the hand. I, I passed his guard and mount on him, but my knee shift out. So on a, between the second and third fight, the quarterfinals and semifinal, again, was only five minutes break, but my knee was already like, a, you know, getting swallowed. And that's when I lost the fight. You no, know? so a lot of times the luck counts a lot in competition. You know, and you no, know? we're getting a lot of head nods from Marcy and Jovan about uh, luck. We understand, uh, Professor. One more question, real quick, before I turn you over to Professor Buyu. Very important question: Flamingo or Botafogo? Which one's best football team? <laughs> Look. Today, Flamengo is way better. There's no compare. Don't compare. But the point is, my friend, let me tell you, give an example for you guys here. It's kind of Flamengo is the Patriots and Botafogo is the Raiders. You know what I mean? We're hardcore fans. We kick the ass. You know, that's the point. You know, we, today, Botafogo is all about to beat them and understand. You go Botafogo Flamengo game, you're going to be 50,000 Flamengo fans against five. 5,000 Botafogo fans, you guys are gonna hear only the 5,000. You know, we're hardcore fans, that's it. You know, we are for that. Botafogo is a team, man, here that on the past was pretty good, pretty famous, you know, and you're doing shit for years, my friend. I'm 50 years old, one Botafogo win twice. 93 South America Championship, 95 Brazilian Championship, that's it. You know, the team is being like a man, very bad management, you know, everything, but the fans are hardcore. You know, we're not there. Don't, we don't love the team because titles. You love the team because the history, the colors, whatever, you know, because the something, something crazy about it, you know. Was... They say that, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't choose. We get chosen, you know. So that's it. But uh, if you put in a record on YouTube there, you're going to see Botafogo fans kicking Flamengo fans' ass in every game. That's it. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> was... You see? Was... Thank you, Professor. Well, I didn't mean to upset you. Thank you so much. I'm getting a lot of messages here. The students are very thankful. We really appreciate all your experience and all your ask, wisdom. Ask Buyu last time he went to the soccer stand. <laughs> wow. Ask Buyu if you know the name of the goalkeeper of his team. He doesn't know the Flamengo fan. You know? Buyu. He doesn't know nothing about the history. My, my, my sport right now, number one, is Jiu-Jitsu, Rodrigo. I don't watch more soccer. I don't have, I, we don't have, we don't have more games to watch. We won everything. There you go. Hey, but listen, quick question. I know, Come I know that, but look. Oh my gosh. Go, go, go. Don't, don't, let's not talk about soccer, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Listen, <laughs> Rodrigo, I, uh, since we, have, since we, I mean, I, like I said, you know, for, uh, thank you so much for you making this, you know, and uh, we're trying to make uh, a guess to be here and they can give it their glimpse about jiu-jitsu. Like some of them, they show moves. Some of them, they're here to talk because this thing is all new for everybody. But uh, just to try to come back to jiu-jitsu and to give them like a little bit of like what's going on around there. Uh, do you believe there is a magic move in jiu-jitsu? And the second question is, I mean, of course, probably like that has to relate it with the first one. But let's say, let's put it this way. Like in your opinion, right? Let's, let's reverse the frame. Like, let's go back in the days, like old school, new school, whatever they call. And do you believe that nowadays jujitsu, it's, oh, I create this move. The, I made it up this move. Uh, do you believe that can be possible? And then the second question comes, okay, do you think exists a perfect move or a magic move that's going to save your your back in a situation so i'm quite i'm asking you this because the way that i see myself like jujitsu it's uh, pretty much the same it's just evolute a little bit related with the grips style some people like to play on top some people like to play on the bottom some some people like different type of guards and then here comes the question okay that has a secret move a magic move that's going to save your day. Do you believe on those kind of things? Like, what, do you, what are your thoughts about, like, the jiu-jitsu from 20 years ago, from now, oh, you know, it's the same jiu-jitsu. And what are your thoughts about, okay, now there's a magic move that's going to pop up, uh, or there's no magic move. It's all about you be magic during the – what are your thoughts about it? Michelle, uh, 
It's a really cool question, man. Listen, like any other sport, man, you know, like a basketball, like 20 years ago, 30 years, 40 years ago, if you see like a Lakers and Celtics from the, you know, when I'm, uh, uh, Larry Bird uh, com compete against uh, uh, Magic Johnson, you know, man, it was different sports. If you see the soccer from the 70s, it's different. You no, know, hey, surfing, man, surfing is so, so it's part of progression, you know, it's part of progress, man. You know, uh, you know, this, this sports is always in progress, always developing, you know, uh, every sports. You know, if you watch the Olympic Games four years ago, what people do in gymnastics, in swimming, people breaking records every day, you know, the human is being wide. First, because today we have a lot of more technology. We have a lot of better supplements, more smart ways of training, you know, uh, better, better physical training, physical education, you know, better trains, guys more, you know, and didn't have that in the past. You didn't have that in the past. There's some videos you guys can put on YouTube of the World Cup, okay? Uh, the second World Cup Brazil won, 1962 in Chile. The players, before the game, smoke a cigarette on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the locker room. Before the game, it was normal. You know, people pack a cigarette, wasn't bad. You know what I mean? Because the people think, oh, you know, people didn't have the, the, the study and know how bad it was there for your health. When my mother turned 15 years old, my grandfather gave to her a pack of cigarettes. And she ended up dying by, by nicotine in her, in her heart, you know, by heart attack because it was full of nicotine. So basically today, we know more about things, man. You know, there's a lot of way more contact. But there's no way you have progress if the roots wasn't there, okay? That's it. That someone had to start to have progress. You know? So, uh, I believe in jujitsu in particular. The roots are the same to everybody. It's the basics. You know how you mount, how you skip the mount, how you do wash your past cigar, self defense. Self defense is the same. Self defense is something the same for years. There's no new self defense. You no, know? maybe uh, some little, di little different details. You no, know? but uh, mostly the same. You know, like people doing like 50 years ago. Uh, what I believe is this, okay, when you put the gear on, man, uh, the gear is a big tool that you have to have open mind to learn. If you know the basics well, what the basics are, uh, okay, you can do this and it's right. You cannot do that because it's wrong. Give an example to you guys here. Very simple. Hipscape. You keep your arms next to your body, you shift your hip, you can repose your guard from the mount, from the side control, someone in the belly, that's it. So we know that someone side control you, someone mount you, someone in the belly, if you roll and turn your back, man, so you're gonna get choke. So that's why your professor said, man, don't turn your back. You had hip escape and face a guard, repose your guard. So the roots are these things, you no know, things you can do right, that everybody do it, and things do wrong. Someone mount you, there's no secret move, guys. You know, it's whoop escape, hip escape, and maybe three or another way to escape, and that's it. But the bases work pretty very well in the situation. And they're working in any situation, street fights, MMA, sport jiu-jitsu. You know, Carson wasn't the kind of guy. Carson was a guy that said he liked position working in any situation. You know, if you show to him Billy Bolo, if Carson was live today, you show to him Billy Bolo, I'm sure his first question for you is going to be like this. Okay, Billy Bolo, pretty nice, but I'll bother guy punch you in the face. What are you going to do it? When you're turning. That was Carson. He liked things that practical, like Kimuras, a lot, a lot of Kimura. He liked a lot. Triangle. I like the arm triangle a lot, you no. Know? So, but I think is it is uh, a lot of progression in sports. And you students, you know, and everybody has to have their open mind to create new moves. You know, until someone tells you it's wrong. That's it. You know, I'm very open. I always let my students be, be, be creative. And let me tell you something. Were you there on, on, on what they're struggling to tell you right now? 1992, I was teaching our generation in Leblon. And uh, we started teaching for kids there, okay? And I remember one little kid, his name was Lucas Luquinhas, was a little blonde, polished kid. 
He came to me to me one day and showed me one position. The position was like this, and I did this position for years later. So let me show a picture for you guys here really quick. Hold on. So he showed me his position and came to me and said, Professor, is this right? And the way he did, I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's right now because uh, that can happen, but he was doing so well. He was doing so well. And, you know, uh, and he was keeping doing, you know, all the time in winning tournaments because of that position, doing academy, and he was the only one doing. So anyways, years later, one of Black Belts did the same position, and he, you know, and become very famous position. You know, and a lot of other guys start doing after that. So I had the picture here. Oh, there you go. Look. That's me in the bottom. And that's Jack McIverne at the top. That was like a, the, the World Championship last year, the final match when I lost the, the, the match there. So that match, he stayed my guard for a long time. And I almost slapped him in the position there. And he and he opened my guard and got a half guard. But look at the position I am right now. See? I have my... My left arm right under his leg and my right arm holding his sleeve here, see? So basically, he was letting go of the grip here, on the, left arm, the, the right arm, sorry, the arm holding the sleeve. He was flipping over in all four position and ending his knees, right? But with the leg controller and coming up, look like a, like a single leg, you know? I don't know if you guys can understand the situation, but uh, was a push from the guy on the bottom. It was a sweep. And he did that, man, like, uh, without nobody notice, without nobody seeing, you know, and I, and I was teaching him, and I said, man, it was incredible, you know, so you had to be creative, you know. And I'm sure that uh, if it's something that really doesn't work, your professor will tell you, man, you should not do this because of that. That's all, you know, that's very important. And answer, Michelle, a second question. Today, Jiu Jitsu has two positions that is no defense. Okay, is the S, S mount that I do, that's not a technical defense. Maybe the guy escape because the guy scramble, he bump you, but it's not a technical defense. Like in the regular mount, it is. Hip escape, whoop escape, you know, the, the sit belt defense. But the S mount, the high mount on your arms like this, and one mount on the top, you're like that, you know, you may escape because you're tough, but it's, that's not okay. If you press your arms like press for the regular mounts, then they will be able to defend. But it's another, is that is right another position? And the other position is the crucifix and moplata together. You know what I talk about? Imagine your moplata, you got a moplata, right? But your free arm here, you hook the other guy arm. The position Clark, Clark Grace do a lot. My student Clark Grace. There's no technical defense for the position. So there's no way like a guy, hey, you got to do this or that, he defends. There's no escape. By far, there's no escape. I think uh, someone can show that. Show that, Lucas. Yeah, right there. Perfect. Well, look in. Yeah, perfect. That's the position, Lucas. Make her sit a little bit, Lucas. Make sure her sit a her. Yeah. So now, no, no, no. Come, no. come back, come back on the floor. Come back, come back on the floor. No, no. Come back, come back. Right there. Now, your left hand, your left hand, you go in the, in the collar to choke. Yep. There you go, that's one position right there. You can have a plata, you have a, a kimura on her right arm. There's a bunch of things you can do there. And she can escape. You know, it's a position. Actually, Mackenzie Durham did a position on her first part fights in the UFC. She did an MMA and she choked the gel the hand like this. So that's a that's the only two positions I know today, Michelle. There's no defense. Everything else, there's a defense. There's a way to escape. And Definitely someone we, we will, for one point, find escape for that one, you know. But by far, nobody found escape. Because uh, if someone creates a new guard or something, someone to come in and create a way to defend, you know. Someone create a new, new submission, someone will come a, a way to defend. Now, uh, the evolution sport is clear, man. There's a lot of new, you know, new things right there. There's a lot of a new position right there, you know. But the core about this, this sport, guys, is... You adapt to just for yourself. You adapt to just for body limitation, you know. And doesn't matter how old you are, you know, doesn't matter how big you are, there's some positions gonna be easier for a guy bigger. 
the sample is going to be easier for guys small. The sample is going to be easier if you, you know, if you have big hands, big feet, you know, depending a lot of your body type. And that's the beauty of the sport. And that's the difference from jujitsu for any other martial arts. You know, I did judo for a long time. I did some capoeira. I did some karate. Then I, when I moved to the United States, I did a lot of boxing, wrestling. All the martial arts are very square. You see, karate, the katas in karate are the same katas for hundreds of years. What do you have in boxing? We had the jab, we had the straight punch, we had the uppercut, we had the cross. That's it. What else? It's all about combinations after. And who do faster the combinations? Who put the combinations better? So after you know the, the five, six moves, is who put the combinations better and faster? And of course, the timing. But there's no one new boxing movement for years, right? In judo, they just regress in judo. In judo, to the Olympic Games of uh, London, you could attack the legs. Then a lot of guys from wrestling from Mongolia, you know, that do judo and wrestling together, they saw winning. The judo federation came and cut the rule. You cannot touch the legs no more. You only can hold the gi here. There's no progression. In jiu-jitsu, my friend, it is progression every day. Somewhere, someone is, the, is inventing a new technique. Every day. In small change, you put a hand right here or put a hand right there, it's better. You no know, one little detail, you no know, one, one inch difference. And that's a cool about the sports. It's infinite. You know, there's no uh, magic. It's time on the mat. And one thing for sure, in one lifetime, you're not going to learn everything. I guarantee you that. And that's not my words. Little Grace's words. Little Grace said that. And that's true. You know, I got my black belt in 1996. If I come back for the point I got my black belt, I was only 25 years old, man. Top of my career. Shape. I didn't know nothing. Today, I know a lot of more. You know, a lot of more. I understand a lot of more the techniques, you know. Of course, my body is not the same, you know. Uh, my physical ability is not the same, definitely is not. But right here, I know a lot more today, a lot more. You know, I learn so much, I learn every day. It doesn't matter if it's a blue belt, a purple belt, doesn't matter. I learn from my students every day. Every day is a new trick. Small little details. Thank you, Professor. I'm gonna go ahead living with Amir. Good question. Look at that one. It's a good picture here. Oh, nice. Carlson Sr. Carlson Sr. Me and Carlson. I had a lot of hair with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Professor. Thank you so much for the knowledge. It's been amazing. Such uh, inspiration. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Tom to say goodbye, but uh, thank you so much for coming. Stay right on here. Thanks for the question. It was amazing. Awesome. Professor uh, Rodrigo, thank you so much. Uh, that was amazing. Um, I, I, I want to take one thing. I don't know if everybody grabbed a hold of this, but, but you mentioned a lot about yoga and surfing and swimming and jujitsu and all these things that are not just physical, but like mental health. And uh, we mentioned it earlier about how important that is for a time like this. Uh, so, so I think you're a great inspiration and stuff like that. I, I'm sorry I missed you last time I went to San Diego, uh, but I, I hope to see you next time. Uh, and we'd love to have you out in Colorado once all this is over. Uh, you know, all the all the guys from Go Squad say that their favorite seminar was uh, your seminar in particular. So thank you, thank you. you out here. Yeah, Tom. Uh, uh, look, one year ago I was in Colorado in Brands Hat, man. That's my family to. To the, to the camp site there, right there. There's no site right there. You know Brian's Head? Uh, no, I don't know that place. A lot Brian's of my guys Head. Yeah. Brian's Head is like a mountain. It's higher than Mammoth, you know? So a year ago, I was right there, man, with my family. I don't do snowboard, because, uh, you know, I hurt myself every time I do it, so I stopped doing it. But uh, my wife and my daughter, they love. So I was there with them and babysitting my son, you know? But you know, the, we live in a, a, a really new experience to everybody, you know what I mean? And like I said in the beginning, man, is the, it is the best time for us to be, you know, uh, to use the jiu-jitsu. Because, of, you know, 
e o jiu-jitsu on the gym, when you put a gi on, it's pretty easy. You know, the, the tough part is to use jiu-jitsu when you're outside the gym, when you do a choice in your life, when you're going to the supermarket, where you're going to eat, you look for the beautiful, you know, uh, vanilla chocolate ice cream and say, man, you know what I mean? You look for the beer, man, I want to drink that beer, you know, and it is what it is, but the truth is on the end of the day, <clears throat> the wrong choice, you know, gonna make you pay price later in life. You know, I don't tell you to be like a, the next Buddha. It's your choice, right? And so I, for example, uh, I, I, I don't, I never liked so much. You know, I had, I, I had my time when I was young and, you know, did my stuff, but uh, for me to drink a, a glass of wine and I don't like beer, you know, I don't have any bad habits, you know, I try to eat very healthy, you know, I've been vegan since, 100% uh, vegan since uh, October last year, and I've been 90% vegan probably for the last 20 years of my life, and, you know, it's all about this, listen, I was talking to Michelle about this like last week, we have now a great opportunity to change the world, you know, for our kids, you know, to see some kids running there, riding back there, your, I think it's a daughter, the same as my daughter, man, and look, it's a lot to learn for this, what, what you passed right now, guys, you know, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what color you have, what religions you follow, you know, what God you pray, how, money, how much money you have in your bank, man, doesn't matter, an invisible virus can kill you, can screw your life, can hurt your family. So it's a lot to learn. You know, it's time now to know to, to enjoy your family members, to tell them and love them so much, to read good books, you know, to watch good movies, and, man, and learn from that, to understand that we all depend on each other. <clears throat> That's, I have a pseudomized engineer, the other one's a lawyer, the other one's a doctor, the other one's a, is a, is a is a Uber driver, the other one is a Vala Parker. If they lost their job, they're not gonna pay my academy. We all depend on each other, you know? And it's time to us to see the, move, the, the, the world a different way. You know, I, I've been speaking for a lot of people all over the world. And it's funny because everybody tell me, bro, I never saw the sky so beautiful. In San Diego here, the last week we had so much good rain, man. I've been here 25 years, I never saw so much rain, man. It was so beautiful, you know. My house right back after the canyon, man, there's so many flowers. And then each day, we had a rabbit right in my backyard. Let me show the picture for you guys. My, <laughs> I've been here in this house for five years. I never saw rabbits, you know. So, you know, I know like people like in Hong Kong, my students just say, man, you know, look at this. That was in my backyard like a few, few days ago. You know, my, my students in Hong Kong say, I never saw the sky so blue. You know, I never, you know, and a friend of mine told the Guan Guanabara Bay in Rio, the water never been so clear. The nature need this break. I, I'm a spiritual man, and I believe in something beyond that, you know. You go like all over this, <laughs> We're going to learn from that, and it's up to us to make a better world. And us, as jiu-jitsu soldiers, man, as jiu-jitsu missionaries, we have a big uh, uh, a part of that. You know, we have a big role in that, you know, to make people understand, hey, you don't have to be greed, man. It's not all yours. You know what I mean? You know, we, we came to this place here as visitors. You know, we, we just, we're just passengers here. That's the truth. That's the truth. You no, know, my grandfather used to tell me, my friend, you die naked, you're gonna born, you're gonna you, you're born naked, you're gonna die naked. You don't bring nothing for you. It's time to us to understand this because this is all about that. Of course, I wanna have a good life. Of course, I wanna travel all the way over the world. I'm gonna, of course, man, I wanna try the best for me, man. But you know, you don't you don't need everything. You know what I mean? We all we all very uh, you know uh, how I say that. When you, want to, when, when you want more stuff, you want more and more and more, man, 
you know, look, look a little bit on the side, man, on the road, man, and see how many people have way less than you, you know. And we are very fortunate to, to, to have what we have. You know, we're very fortunate. There's a lot of people in a really bad situation that, that now it's up to us to help these people. You know? And so, Tom, I don't know if you know that, but my Academy PB is making 20 years this year. Yeah. And since November 15, brother, we've been doing a big remodeling there. The camp has been closed. Yeah. You know, and I, I spent almost 100 grand to do a nice remodel. We put, the, we put the middle wall down. I expanded that, man. Everything will be new. And we get caught between the COVID right now. You know, there's no workers there. That has been the place before a month and a half. Nothing. Just sitting, waiting. We still waiting for the city to give us the last permit so we can finish the job. So, November 15, when I, I commit myself to make, okay, I'm going to give to the students 20 years anniversary, you know, a brand new academy, everything new. And I thought myself, listen, you know, I, for three years, I'm not being raised the price. I'm going to raise the price a little bit, you know, because uh, it is what it is. You no, know, uh, I got to spend a lot of money on the remodeling. Right now, my friend, I'm going to do opposites. My academy will be cheaper. And a lot of my students come train for free and it will be my guest because I'm going to let the train for free because uh, I know how I'm important for them to the balance their life, you know, have the camp there ready for them. Whatever they can pay me, they're going to pay me whatever they can. I don't care. You know, my camp is probably going to come back for the price was 20 years ago. Rodrigo, I, I just wanted to oh, make mention, like, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super honored to be in your lineage. Boy, you've done a great job as a leader. You're an amazing leader. Amir is a fantastic leader. So I'm super proud to be in this uh, tribe, we call it, you know, this, this lineage that we have through you, through Buyu and Amir. He's, you know, you, you speak all the, the things that I try to, you know, uh, emphasize every day. So I'm super honored to, to be with you and, and listen to what you have to share. My wrong brother, thank you, man. No, but that's like true, man. No, sometimes you, you know, the world, the system, and the, the, the way we live, you no, know, we forget about this. But you, you have to think, man, the way you came to the earth and, you know, the way we go, man. You know, nobody's mortal. You know, you know, I, I, nobody's, nobody's immortal. No, we, 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 are, we just like a, I, I, I'm a, I like to read a lot. No, I'm, and I'm, I come from a very spiritual family, but you need to know my mother, my grandfather, and my grandmother. You know, that's the way they, 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 they raised me, man. Like, you no, know, all natural things. I never took so much medicine in my life, never took drugs. You no, know, like, a, if I need to take a tablet, like my mother was giving a tea. You know, and I learned from them, man, you know, having human experience, you know, that there for me. So the situation for that, like, for, for the happen right now, you know, and on the top of that, of course, for the way I got raised and for being a jiu-jitsu missionary, it's very easy. You know, it's very easy. You know, the harder part for me is keeping my kids busy. You know, my ego is only three years old, man. To keep that kid busy all day, that's tough. But... <laughs> I'm not worried about nothing, man. If I had to sell everything, everything that I build there and start for zero points, I'm ready. No problem at all. No problem at all. And I tell you something, if you guys need my help, man, I'm here to help any one of you guys. Don't worry about it. You know, money, my friend, someone invent that shit. No, I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> you know, our, our grand, grand, grandparents, at the time they didn't have money in the world, they exchanged things, right? You know, Tom, your grand grandparents used to should have like a farmer and he used to plant the carrots there and lettuce. And I'm your grand grandparent, you no, know, used to have like a, a farm and had pigs right there. And Joe and grand grand grandparents, you no, know, he's a farm of cow and had milk there. And you know, they all exchange. That's the way it used to be. And you still live in the 2020 right now, we used to exchange, man, right? Money is all exchange energy. That's it. This is a way people create to, I don't know. Not to create some rules, as I think, no, but if I had to come back for the way we were before, you know, I got to clean my account to pay the, 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 the membership. No worry, let's do it. You no, know, it's all about this. You know, it's all about like a, I think it's a lot to learn for what we passed right now, the whole world. And I hope the politicians know, uh, understand that and send a message. You know what I mean? You know, unfortunately, it's not being happening, but. You know, if we understand this, it's more important than anything else. You know? 
Thank you guys. I, I think that probably wraps up our time, but uh, I appreciate everybody coming and, and thank you so much, Professor, for, for spending your time. Sophia, 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 Rodrigo is a very family guy too, you know, like uh, just so you guys know. And that's, I think that's translates like where we're trying to build with uh, our academies, you know, Amir, Tom, you know, like create that family environment. That, uh, you guys should part of this. Look, that's his son right there, Igor. If you guys are not careful, I'll let's shame for this generation here, okay? Let's shame for them. Exactly. Because they're going to be the next presidents, the next doctors, the next firemen, the next police officers, you know. So we need to change for them. That's it. You know. And for her, yeah. look, she's an national veterinary here <laughs> and BJJ black belt. And she's going to be the, the next uh, pop singer, next Ariana Grande. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You know, I, I always be involved, you know, on, on that kind of uh, uh, movement, you know, I always be involved with it. Any movement is uh, pro nature, you know, like, uh, you know, my whole life, you know, uh, directly and indirectly, you know, I always do donation for St. Jude's, St. Jude's Hospital, uh, it's a research hospital of cancer here in San Diego, you know, I always be involved with like in any nature movement, like, you know, uh, Amazon Free and Greenpeace and, you know, uh, the, the shepherds, you know, the sea shepherds. You know, I always, I you know, I always, you know what I mean? And, and my academy, like I said, you guys at the beginning, you know, you, 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 we sell health, man. You know, we don't sell, you know, bad food. We don't sell like a bad habits. You no, know, we sell health. It's all about this. You know, I had like a, I, I tell the story another time for you guys, but I had like for five years, that guy was a homeless. You know, and become one of my top students in my academy. You know, he guy came from my academy with a ball of silence. Just got out of jail, knocked my door, wrote in the paper, I want to change this for free. And I like the guy, and he changed this for free. My camp for five years, become a top purple belt, you know, national champion. You know, one time in the weekend, he won four gold medals on the competition. You know, national champion gi, national champion no gi in, in the weight and the weight open division in the weekend, you know, national. So, you know, one, one, one day I tell the story for you guys about that, you know, but it's all about this, you know, when you're on the mat, you know, there's no race, there's no size, there's no column, you're all the same, you know. 100%, 100%. Love that message. Okay, guys, my family's about to eat dinner and I'm about family too, so I got to go. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Rodrigo. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you, Rodrigo. Hey guys, nice to speak everybody. Okay, guys, be strong. Thanks for sure to put this, this together, guys. And you know, uh for those that can keep supporting your school. Okay, so when everything goes over, we'll be there for you guys, okay?